Okay, everyone, we will give it a minute here for everybody to get on. Um, we have a lot of information to, to go through and try to decipher. And so one, I just wanna welcome you all um, to this webinar. It's actually put together and provided to you through funds by both the Colorado Energy Office and Excel Energy with the efforts that the intent is really to be able to provide you with the tools to make it through the permitting um, cycle and, and getting what is needed as far as demonstrating compliance with the energy code and kind of getting it all put together uh, at the same time in, in one edition. So with that being said, um, if you have any questions, because there's a lot of information here, please feel free to type it in the chat, type it in the, the question and answer, and I will do my best to keep an eye on those locations to answer it. I think it's probably better for everyone if we answer or you know address the questions that come up when the slide is there, um, as opposed to um, typically for these webinars, we, we hold questions till the end. So just feel free to ask your questions as we move about on this particular webinar. So welcome everyone. Today we're gonna to talk about the requirements for the energy code and what should be provided for that permit submittal. So we're not going to hold back. We're gonna jump right into it. And really quite often, if you look into the energy code, it really gives you a lot of guidance and a lot of assistance to be able to get there. And one of the sections that I think gets overlooked, but really should be utilized is section R103.2. And what this section does is tell you what are the requirements that need to be placed on those construction documents. And, and really, if this information is shown on the plans, it's pretty easy to make it through that permitting process. Now, what you're gonna notice is we are just focusing for this particular webinar on the 2018 and the 2021, because those are the codes that um, uh, are in effect for the areas that have been um, dealing with the, the after effects of the Marshall Fire. So that is all of the two codes that we will be focusing on here. So what you see on the left-hand side is what you're gonna find out of the 2018. And then what you see on the right-hand side is what you're gonna see out of the uh, 2021. Now the real only difference between the two is this wonderful thing that happened in the 2021 where it is now required that you declare which energy compliance path this project was designed to. And Quite honestly, whether you're on the 2018 or the 2021, if you place that on your plans, I can guarantee you, you will be, um, plans examiners will be very happy to know because we aren't trying to figure out what exactly is it that you're utilizing. Because sometimes there might be something that would indicate, oh, we're going prescriptive, and yet you're getting a report document that says to the contrary. So Declaring what it is, is going to make a huge difference as far as how are things reviewed and what is actually reviewed. So let's talk about what these compliance paths are, whether you're in the 2018 and the 2021. So we're going to focus right now with your options that are available for the 2018. Now you have the option of going prescriptive. That is your first compliance path. With that particular compliance path, there are three options that are available with it. So if you say I'm going prescriptive and I get those plans, I'm gonna ask you which option of prescription are you going with? Are you going with the insulation uh, and fenestration criteria, that particular table, the table that probably when anybody says going prescriptive instantly comes to mind? Um, are you going to go with the U-factor alternative where it's that assembly approach? 
or are you using the total UA alternative, which is your res check? So when you say prescriptive, say which one of these three that you're going to utilize. Then you have your uh, building uh, performance, and then you have your energy rating index or your ERI. Now in the ERI for the 2018, there are some provisions that is dealing with whether you are installing on-site renewable or you're not installing on-site renewable. Um, the base of what's happening for the ERI, there isn't a whole lot of difference, but there are a little bit of distinctions with that. Now, as you can see for the, the 2021, there's not a whole lot of difference other than if you look up at the prescriptive compliance path, things changed. So you'll notice that it's now the insulation fenestration criteria. Your second option is your R value alternative. So what happened in the 2018, the insulation and fenestration criteria is basically that R value table, the table that everybody thinks about. Um, and then the in the 2021, that insulation and fenestration criteria table is actually dealing with the U factor um, option. And that's the one where you're utilizing the assembly approach. Um, and then the alternative is utilizing that R value table, the table that is probably the most familiar for the majority of the people who utilize the IECC. And I do see a question that came up. Um, and the question is, will this cover both residential and commercial? It will not. Uh, the focus on this particular training is dealing with residential. Um, it kind of goes um, in depth with that. So it, this is all dealing with the residential aspect. And then uh, not only do you have the prescriptive, you have your total building performance. And then again, you have your energy rating index, your ERI. In the 2021, there is a very distinct um, distinction that goes on whether or not you're utilizing on-site renewable energy or not utilizing on-site renewable energy. And depending on which one it is, is going to determine what type of documents will need to be submitted with it. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now we've, we've taken a look at what the, uh, the energy compliance path is. Let's, let's see what some other items there are. Now, uh, R103.2.1 states that there needs to be a depiction of what that thermal envelope is. So as you can see on the screen, we have you know, two types of thermal envelope that are available. You have the more simple one where it's basically, you know, that that what I, I like to think of a, a grade school house where it's the box and the triangle on top type of deal. And it's very easy to determine where that thermal envelope is. And then the one on the right is a little bit more complex um, as far as where that thermal envelope is, because, you know, you you now are not just that straight up, cross down type of deal. You're up cross, jag it up over here. And then there's some other, you know, locations where you see insulation and, and so forth. So defining exactly where that thermal envelope is, is really going to assist in moving it through because it eliminates a lot of questions for the plan reviewer. Now, the other thing that I want to let you know is I'm going to give you some, some hints and some just some suggestions and so forth of things that have come across that I've had to write up comments for or others have had to write up comments for so that we can you know help you not kind of uh, repeat those type of things and just to kind of get you right off the bat. And so here's an example of of what I had. So this particular is depicting exactly where that thermal envelope is. And then this is where they were uh, showing where the insulation values were going to be, um, which happened to differ from some of the other information that was provided there. So there was questions about what exactly is going to be utilized. And so I, you know, put a nice little red square. I hope you all can see this of where there were some questions. We have, you know, some of the walls are saying an R21 minimum. 
Um, we have on here that says provide loose fill insulation in the attic to, and the R value per the code. And then again, we have here at the rim, the R value per the code. Um, and so I don't know about a lot of you, we probably have a little bit more uh, contractors out in the field that have access, ready access to the energy code um, by, you know, maybe on their phone, going on to ICC's website and looking up the codes through the digital codes platform. But most contractors out there and, and builders out there, while they're familiar with what the energy code is, may not have those specific document or books right there readily available. So how do you assist them to make sure that how you design the project is, is getting out in the field? And so that was one of my comments, and this is how they addressed it. They left those, those uh, notes on the plans as they were, but they provided a nice little table that now really specified, okay, so the walls are going to be this, the floors are going to be this, the ceiling is going to be this, and all this does is really assist to be able to get to, you know, what you need to know and where you need to go with this. And then here's another example. This is one of those things that I think is very beneficial because not only does it show where the thermal envelope is per se, but it also gives you those specific, those specific R value information and they provided the information for the uh, glazing. So having it all right here, right there, it, it makes it really simple. It tells us, you know, there's a requirement that says you have to provide what the R value is, what the, the type of insulation is, which is what this plan does. Because if you look in the attic, it says, you know, loose fill insulation that gives you at least an idea. This gives you an idea of what those R values are and where they're located and, and what's involved for that thermal envelope. Now, one of the things you want to keep in mind when you start talking about that thermal envelope is making sure it's very clear about whether these particular items are in or out, right? Typically, there's a question, is that crawl space in or out? Is it demonstrated that those walls are insulated or the floor is insulated? What about the garage? We have garages right now that are you know, being conditioned and are part of that thermal envelope. They're not out of the thermal envelope like they have been in the past. So there's always that question, you know, what are, what are garages and attics? Attics is another area um, that is becoming more and more of the question that I'm hearing about is, is that attic inside the thermal envelope or outside the thermal envelope? So as a designer, as a builder, as a, a architect, making sure that it's very defined and knowing if this is in or out is gonna be very helpful for that plan reviewer because then there's a question that they don't have to ask. They know, okay, that should be an R20 or whatever the case may be. The other thing is keep in mind now that there is a requirement, whether you're in the 18 or the 21, about uh, fuel burning appliance rooms. And that's basically, is that mechanical room inside or out? And that's really going to determine, right? What type of equipment is in there? Is it um, direct vent appliances? So then these requirements are, are not going to be uh, required, or is it that it's not a direct vent appliance. And so now you're looking at, there's the potential that you are going to have to uh, completely isolate that particular room, meaning you know, you're gonna have to put the insulation values uh, for the uh, thermal envelope, whether that's the wall, ceiling, floors, whatever's gonna be involved with it. Uh, there's gonna need to be ceiling, the doors cannot, um, have any louvers, it has to be gasketed. And then now that, you know, uh, reflects for that ductwork and the water lines, those are going to have to be insulated. So all of this comes into play. So that's an awful lot of information. And so sometimes it's just better to put the little note, direct vent appliances. There you go, out the door. And here we go. The other thing to keep in mind too, is when you start talking about um, thermal, versus sound, right? If we're talking about insulation being installed in the wall because it's part of that thermal envelope, then it needs to be demonstrated and shown and included into the various uh, uh, report documents. If it's in there because it happens to be a fire rated assembly or it's dealing with sound, that is not part of the requirements for the, the thermal envelope per se. It might be, but it's not strictly just 
therefore the thermal envelope. So unless that insulation is being used as part of the thermal envelope, it shouldn't be included in the documentation as far as like your res check um, or uh, any of your other uh, energy compliance path documents. So where this would come into play is quite often like in a, in a situation such as this, if you recall the area that is pink had shown some insulation. Now, because we're talking about insulation above uh, an exterior storage and insulation that was above the, the west mechanical room and the utility room, the question comes into play is, is it being thermally isolated because the appliances aren't direct vent or they're not being conditioned, so you're showing what's going on? Or is this because it's a sound situation? You want to make sure that it's, it's, you know, you're not getting the sound in the quote unquote living spaces. Um, and so keep that in mind as a designer and architect, you know, show that on there, just maybe have a, some sort of differentiation that says for sound or something along those lines and don't include those floors in this case into like res check. The other thing I just wanted to bring up really, really briefly is, you know, this is dealing with residential and remember our twos, our threes and our fours that are three stories or less are required to comply with the residential provisions of the IECC. And so quite often that's where this may come into play is where you look on the, the exterior walls where it's pink. We know that that's for the thermal envelope. It's been defined. The, uh, Blue, as you see here, are dealing with sound, but what are we doing with those green areas? It, are, are those uh, corridors being conditioned? And so that is something that it, it doesn't matter. The insulation that's in there is probably fire rated in sound, or is it that those corridors are not being conditioned and it's, it's part of that thermal envelope? So just make it clear um, when you're dealing with multifamily um, in, in this particular aspect. So as you see, just having that quick little discussion, we've taken care of the energy compliance path. We've talked about uh, insulation materials and there are values where they're located and that thermal envelope depiction. So now let's take a look about the fenestration. Now fenestration on the 2018 for climate zone five, you do have requirements for your U factor and there is not a requirement for your solar heat gain coefficient. Now for the 2021 in climate zone five, the solar heat gain coefficient, there is a requirement now, the maximum is a 0 0.40. Now I know with a lot of the uh, energy reports I get and for the uh, glazing that I am seeing, uh, the majority of them, they're all meeting that anyway. So it's not really that big of a deal, but it is something that needs to be documented and is required to be placed on the plan. So put that information about what that solar heat gain coefficient for the glazing is. So I see this often. Um, here's uh, just some examples. I've seen it as a window schedule where they'll give me that U factor. That's perfectly fine. Remember if it's for the 2021, also include that solar heat gain coefficient or whether it's a note. And if you notice here, there's a note that says, you know, the maximum fenestration for the glazing is gonna be the 0.30. Um, and, and, and that's perfectly acceptable too when we're talking about residential. So we, we can check off our U factors. Another thing that's gonna be so important is your air sealing details. And so here's the tables that you're gonna find. Here's on the left-hand side is your 2018 requirements. On the right-hand side is your 2021. And as you can see, pretty much the components are the same. There are some changes as far as your air barrier criteria or your insulation installation criteria, but there's only a few changes such as in the crawl space on the 2021, it now includes uh, basement and slab foundations as part of it. Um, and then you continue on and look at that. So here are a couple of examples and this is where you all are going to participate because I, you don't get to sit around and, and you know, 
not participate with this. These are examples of what was provided to demonstrate compliance with air sealing. So my question for you is, would you accept the top portion there that says the building thermal envelope shall be durably sealed to limit air infiltration and the following shall be caulked, gasketed, uh, weather stripped or otherwise sealed with an air bearing material, suitable film or solid material, and then list the particular items. So I have one no. Anybody else? Anybody else brave? Come on. It's a yes or no. I have a yes. A no. A yes. No. Yes. Okay, at the moment we are tied. So with, oh, oh, nope, we're still tied. <laughs> so now what I'm gonna ask you is for the bottom three here um, that talks about openings between uh, windows and doors, the attic access openings and the rim joist junctions, Starting right now for those three, would you accept those as explanations for or details for air barriers and um, uh, air sealing? I have a yes, I have a yes, I have a yes. Yes, yes, nope, oh. I had a couple of no's come in real quick and a yes. And a yes. Okay, so here is how what ha, what I did. Good, bad, or indifferent. This is what I did. The top one is a no. The bottom three I did accept. And here's my here's my explanation for it. If you go into 103.2, the the table I keep showing intermittent on the slides, it talks about this. You are required to detail this on the plants. Now, in my opinion, I do not feel that the top really details what this is. This is, quite honestly, this is my review comment basically being placed on the plants. Um, and, and it's not, it doesn't give any direction for the, the contractor or the builder, right? They look at that and there's, it's kind of they're left on their own and they just have to hope whatever they do will actually meet the requirement and isn't going to cause an issue um, when the inspector goes out, right? Or is not going to cause an issue that it actually will cause damage and cause at some point those assemblies to fail? Uh, oh, Great question. So for number 10, rigid insulation on the attic access panel is thermal info, not air sealing, correct? Um, yes, you, you are correct. That is talking about insulation and uh, to meet that requirement of the surrounding insulation R value. And if I could get those plans back because they were paper, it would have also had information about it being air sealed. So I do apologize for that. That is a great catch, Jason. Um, but I did accept it because there was further information. I just did not take a good picture of it that included it. <laughs> but the reason why I did allow those bottom three is because I can read it. I have direction as far as how it's supposed to be installed. So those builders, the contractors, they know this is how the architect and the designer designed this house. And I, as a contractor or a builder, I can take that information that's placed there and be able to actually build it with the intent that it's meeting the air barrier and air sealing requirement. Which leads us to this. A picture is truly worth a thousand words. You can take a look at what you see on the left-hand side on the top. Here's an example of 
uh, dealing with an air barrier of a tub on the exterior wall. And it's very clear. I can see that. I can picture it. Whether I read the stuff on the side, I see what it is that I need to do. Right? How many here can see that top picture and know exactly what it is that that architect had intended for it to be done? Anyone? They're all good with it? I, I'm good with it, right? And then if you see on the bottom there, there's an example of when you have it there, you actually get that out in the field, right? The whole intent is the contractor and the, the builder, they are not in charge of the design of the building. They are not responsible of figuring what this should be and what it should be look, you know, what it should look like. They are there to, you know, be told, how did you design this building? How is this supposed to be? And, and they'll do it, but you have to give them that information to do it. So the whole picture is worth a thousand words, really speeds things up because the plans examiner is very easily able to uh, verify that those requirements have been demonstrated. And you might say, well, you know, how can you do an air barrier wrong? I've actually had to write a review comment that the that air barrier is incorrect because it it would, you know, potentially cause issues. It's not set up correctly per what's in that table. And so I have had to send that uh, require that uh, that uh, information out there. So if it had not been provided at at plan review where I was able to see and correct it now where it's just some lines on a piece of paper as opposed to the contractor who took the time, took the material and the labor and installed it and the inspector goes out and says, whoa, you can't do this, this is incorrect. Then all of a sudden the builder and contractor not only loses time with that inspection and fails the inspection, now they are taking up more time and more material or more labeled because now that has to be removed. It has to then be reinstalled, which requires more material, more labor, uh, more scheduling time. And the inspector now has to go back out for a second inspection on something to make sure that it isn't going to be something that is going to cause damage to that assembly. So it, it really is a whole lot of, of um, simplification for everything down the road having those details provided at plan review. Um, there are a lot of resources out there to uh, find this material. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually putting together uh, an air barrier sheet that can be just attached if you don't have it. ABBA, the Air Barrier Association of America has a whole bunch of, of air barrier details that can be utilized. You can go to, um, Oh, shoot. Uh, Building America. Building America has a whole bunch of details that show and you can go in. It has CADs. It explains all these different uh, components. There's a lot of resources out there to really assist you in, in providing that information to get it to the building department, the plans examiners and the builders. So there are resources out there for that. And then, you know, there are actually some items in that list where notes are going to work. Not always do I get the, uh, uh, you know, a detail that talks about openings between, you know, windows and door assemblies and their, and their jams. I don't always get a detail showing that. I do have details showing that, but typically I'll see that as a note. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. It looks like I have a couple of questions that came in. Um, so if that whole area is closed cell spray foam, do you still need the thin profile wall sheathing? And I'm assuming you are talking about, um, for the tub, Eric. Yes. Okay. So what I... I believe the intent is, is I think that that is very possibly uh, available because an air barrier, when it hits a certain 
Uh, air permeability, it is now considered to be, or I'm sorry, closed cell foam, it's now considered to be a, an air barrier. It doesn't say that it has to be a, a thin uh, film there. All it says is that the air barrier installed at the exterior wall adjacent to the showers and tubs shall separate the wall from the shower or tub. So basically what they want is you got that sheathing, your insulation, and then an air barrier. It doesn't say that they have to be two separate components. So you could utilize closed cell foam in that particular fashion, in my opinion. I would not have an issue with it. I hope that helps. So now let's talk about where we're at. So, so far we've addressed the whole insulation, uh, the the fenestration U factor, we've talked about air sealing details, you know, the depiction of that thermal envelope, the energy compliance pass. So we've, and, and for the most part, we have hit the components as far as that thermal envelope. Now, the one thing I didn't bring up is a slide that deals with the area weighted average for your U factor or your um, solar heat gain coefficient. If you are utilizing that particular option, you are gonna also need to provide the calculation for it, meaning you're gonna have to give the, the area and then the area of what that U factor is for those areas, add everything up, divide it, and then you're gonna have to give that information. And that area uh, weighted average is gonna have to demonstrate that it meets the U factor and solar heat gain coefficient. So with that being said, um, I didn't wanna necessarily miss that and not have that there for you all. So that is something that would be required if it's being utilized. Um, I think it was probably a little bit more predominant, you know, maybe six, seven years ago when glazing was trying to really uh, keep up with things. But um, glazing, is one of those industries that has really kind of latched on to that whole, uh, the energy code uh, part of that. Um, and, you know, you see a lot of, of glazing now that does meet that U factor when we're talking about residential. Um, so there is that. And in the 2021, there is even an exception in there that talks about, uh, an exception for the for uh, like climate zone five when you are um, I have to look it up to make sure I think it's fourth yes if you are above four thousand feet in elevation then you are permitted instead of the 0 0.30 glazing you can use the 0 0.32 because you do uh, hit climate zone five for you know uh, those areas whether you're you know, Boulder County or Louisville or um, Superior uh, for the 2021, you do get that um, break, I guess you could say, understanding the whole elevation issue and glazing. So you do have that with you. So now the next components that we're going to take a look at is, you know, the mechanical system design criteria and what the, the those systems are as far as the equipment type, your sizes, your efficiency, and then also talking about number seven, which is dealing with your duct sealing or uh, your duct and pipe insulation and where all those are going to be located. So with that, you should be providing a manual J. It's re Required. It's required not only out of the energy code, but it's also required out of the IRC. And it has been a component of the single family and two family dwelling code since all the way through, I think we found it, um, that it was in there in 1992, 91. I can't remember now which one it is, um, but it's been in there forever. And so now, it's also correlated as far as uh, requirements within the energy code too. And the, the point of that is, is because where the energy efficiency really comes from, it's not necessarily the quote unquote, you know, pink in the wall type of deal. If you don't have, you know, air barriers and insulation in the walls and the thermal envelope where you should be, your mechanical equipment is never going to run properly. Right. And so, um, the 
everything works as a system, but where you're going to get your energy efficiency is really with the uh, mechanical equipment because that's where you're saving the energy. That's where you're really seeing that that um, return on investment type deal. Um, and so because of that, um, this is where the manual J and the manual S really come in. And so your manual J is going to have your heating and cooling loads and your manual S is the equipment that is sized per your heating and cooling loads. So manual J heating loads, manual S is the equipment selection. Now you can see that there's software. I think we've all probably seen software um, that gives us the information for manual J's, right soft, elite, um, but there isn't really software that is very specific for a manual S, but typically in uh, WriteSoft and Elite, they have a section that talks about and gives you the information as far as uh, the sizing and the efficiency that you're gonna find. Um, is manual J and S required in boiler only HVAC systems? Yes, uh, a boiler system would require a, a manual J and S, just like a heat pump would also. Um, and so if you can see on the screen here, the top part here is giving you uh, your mechanical system design criteria. You have your temperatures, um, the uh, square footage, what your um, humidity is. And so all that information is up on that top half. And then the mechanical and service uh, heating systems, the equipment types, the sizes and efficiency is on that lower part here where it says the heating equipment summary and the cooling uh, equipment summary. It gives us what that efficiency is for either one. It tells us what model it is, what, what type of equipment. It tells us what for the heating, what that heating output is, the 33,000. It also gives us what the total cooling is, which is the 21,000. And so this document right here um, gives you a whole bunch of the information that's required out of table 103.2. And so the other component of that is the manual D because it talks about you need to know uh, where the, the ductwork is being located and that's what the manual D does. Now the manual D is also gonna give you a lot more information from that and we'll talk about that in just a second. But the, the manual D sometimes will tell you, you know, uh, duct sealing uh, the, or maybe pipe insulation uh, or the duct insulation and where the location is, obviously. Um, sometimes you'll see that as a note. Sometimes you'll see that insulation is being provided on the ductwork because it'll be like squiggly lines. Sometimes they'll, they'll show that um, on there. But sometimes it's just put in as a note. And as a designer or an architect, if you notice that there isn't a note being provided on the manual D, then provide that note on the plans because then you don't have to either have it redlined, which you never want it to have a whole bunch of red lines because there are communities there um, that do not redline plans. So then it has to go back for um, uh, you know a, a second plan review instead of just you know, getting it moved along the way there. So put a note on there. It's, it's pretty simple. I'll, I'll see it. Um, as you see on the screen, I'll have a, a energy code analysis. I have, there's this great builder that um, I've done quite a few of their plans. They have an energy code analysis sheet, just like the building code analysis and gives the information I have said over and over again. And this, uh, builder or I'm not builder, this designer has um, taken that information and puts it on there, those items that are always in question or items that, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily see on the plans. Um, oh, okay. So I have a question that came in and it's often we do not engineer for a single family home and let subcontractor provide design and sizing is it is acceptable to be deferred? Um, I know that on occasion there has been uh, communities that have deferred manual J and S um, for uh, 
there might be a couple of reasons, but as a whole, it's not deferred. And most jurisdictions now are not going to defer that manual J, S, and D because that's going to really determine quite a few things that, that will be happening and that they need to review for the project. So typically, no, it's not something that would be deferred. And so here's something else that, oh, can you prepare a manual, oh, whoa. Uh, can you prepare a manual J without the specific appliances listed? You can prepare a manual J because the manual J components um, is dealing with what the heat loads are. So I'm assuming what you're saying is you don't, you are asking whether or not you have to, in your manual J, specify what type of mechanical equipment will be utilized. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you can have a manual J and, and just have that, but understand that, you know, per the energy code and even what you find um, in the IRC, it does state a manual S is required. And so the uh, type of equipment that's going to be picked out is going to need to be demonstrated. You know, maybe you could do it as a mechanical schedule type deal, what you would see on the commercial side, but then there's information that's going to be needed. You know, what's the output? What's the efficiency, you know, to it? So um, uh, that information is going to need to be provided, whether it's on the Manual J itself or whether you provide it as a separate documentation. Um, engineering now required as far as the mechanical, is that the, the question? I'll, oh, just a statement. Okay, yes, there, there is a lot that, that's involved with it. So getting back to what we have on the screen here, the manual D actually provides a lot of information and more specifically when we start talking about the insulation that's required because um, whether you're in the 18 or whether you're in the 21, supply and returns that are in the attic that are three inches or larger are required to be an R8. Um, and then if it's in any other location and it's three size or three inches or greater, it's going to be required to be an R6. And then on the 2021, you have a lot more options that are involved with that. So with that being said, the manual D does a lot more than just show what that in, you know, what that uh, ductwork is and where it's going to be. It's also going to give you what that size of the, the ductwork is. So you know, as an inspector, as a contractor, um, what insulation needs to be placed in there. You know, now hopefully all of this is in the thermal envelope, so it doesn't matter what the you know, insulation value or the size of it is because you don't have to insulate it. But if it's outside that thermal envelope. Now all that ductwork has to be insulated and depending on the size and the location of where it is, is gonna determine you know, how much uh, insulation is gonna be there. Now let's play the match game. And I, I bring this up often because if you are a designer or a, a builder, architect, whatever, you need to make sure that these three components of your submittal match, that means Whatever is placed on your construction plans is the values that you're going to find in the energy compliance documents, whether it's res check, simulated performance, ERI, whatever the case may be, that it's placed in there and that your manual JDNS um, also have that information. Now, quite often what I find is that the construction plans and the compliance documents probably do match but the manual J does not. And the reason why that typically is, is because in the very beginning, the three entities, whatever they're gonna be, whoever's doing the plans, the compliance document and the manual J get together, they discuss it, all the information is passed around and the, the documentation is created. So the, the, we'll say the mechanical contractor is doing the manual J, he does it to what the information he was given, he gives the manual J to the architect or the designer for it. And then what happens? We all know 
that the uh, homeowner changes their mind or there's something that they have to adjust. So values get changed and everything happens. The construction plans person uh, takes that information, gives it to the energy compliance document because they want to make sure that you know they're compliant. But often there's this miscommunication and that information doesn't make it to the person that's doing the manual J. And so this is my plea. I, I realize there's a whole bunch of moving components that are going on and I know that things change, but instead of having to have, you know, another round of comments that come in because things aren't matching and sometimes what's not matching may not make a difference, but it, it, it could very well be. And so instead of having to redo the manual J again, because review comments were out, do it right from the get-go. You have your final construction plans, whatever the, the stuff has changed, give the information to the person doing the manual J. They can very, you know, put adjust the uh, items that are in there that need to be adjusted and then move from there. And that just saves a whole lot of confusion for the plan reviewer, which is the correct documents, what's the correct information. Then they have to ask the question, whether it's sending out a review comment or making phone calls or whatever. It all of that does is take up time and take up time that your plans are sitting there instead of having the permit out and being able to really start the construction. So now that we've hit all of these items on there, there's only a couple of things left really on that list that we need to talk about. One is, let's talk about mechanical ventilation, right? You need to let us know what it is. What are you utilizing for your whole house mechanical ventilation? Remember that um, outdoor intakes and exhausts have to have dampers on them um, so that they are closed when the ventilation system isn't on there. I don't see that note very often on the plans. And again, when it comes to the energy code, they do not require that whole house mechanical ventilation happens. Um, this is where there's that relationship between the IRC and the IECC. The requirement comes out of um, you know, the IE or the IRC, but what the IECC or the energy code does regulate is making sure that it meets what the fan efficiency is per the table that's in there. Now, and remember H, uh, uh, ERVs and HRVs that are um, you know, uh, not part of the uh, HVAC system are not required to be involved with that. Um, now on the 2021, there are a couple of changes with that. Um, you still are required, you still have to have the intakes. The, the big thing is, whoops, the big thing is, um, you know, the, the mechanical ventilation fans, making sure that it's efficient and it meets those needs because in the 2021, there is testing for uh, the ventilation systems, not just the whole house, you know, all the ventilation systems, making sure that what was designed is actually getting out there and that, you know, so having that information there is really gonna assist down the road. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, equipment and system controls. While there are some controls that are required in the 2018, you know, your thermostats, if you have, you know, snow melt systems and so forth, the uh, equipment and controls are probably a little bit more prevalent when it comes to the 2021. And so there are some control requirements on the interior lighting for um, that can be controlled by an occupancy sensor or a dimmer. My suggestion is put a dimmer in. I don't, you know, and it's it's um, exempt from uh, bathrooms, halls, um, exterior lighting fixtures. They have their own requirements and then lighting design for safety and security. And you might say, where is that going to be placed on a residential home? Remember that our twos, our threes, and our fours that are three stories or less still have to comply with this section. So this would probably be more along the lines for those corridors and um, stairwells that are involved in that multifamily. Those would be considered, in my opinion, designed for safety and security. So those would not be required to be on a dimmer or an occupancy sensor. And so here's just an example. I have plans for the, the jurisdiction that I review plans for. Um, they're already putting in dimmer switch and, and motion sensors. And, and this is what it would be look that it would look like. So having that on the plans just makes it very simple for the plan reviewer and then makes it very simple for 
you know, the, the contractors out in the field to know, okay, I need to put a motion sensor because again, how many contractors have that energy code book right there and they're wiring the house and they're looking to see, are there any new changes in there that I need to put in there? Should they know? Absolutely. But we also need to help them to be able to make sure that they're doing the right thing. What would be an example of an approved mechanical ventilation testing entity be? Um, most uh, most rating rater com companies that do energy rating, the blower door test, duct testing, they have the capability to um, do uh, ventilation testing. It's it's a real simple process. It's you know it's the uh, it's a, a flow box goes up to the vent. Uh, they check to see how much is going through. They have the their their monitor and it'll show what it is. It it doesn't take very long, but it definitely will tell you. <laughs> whether you have good uh, flow, ventilation flow, or, or it's not meeting how the, the project was designed for. And so there are some exterior controls now. Um, so if you happen to have uh, exterior lighting that has power that's greater than uh, 30 watts, then you need to have uh, some controls on it. You know, you're going to have that on-off switch, um, but then you're going to have to have it where it automatically turns off when there's daylight present and it satisfies, you know, what the needs would be or uh, uh, something that is, would be on a, a timer. Um, and then something that's going to override that if there is a need for it to be uh, overridden, but then it resets itself to go back to the normal operation within 24 hours. And here's an example of, you know, something you might see on a set of plans that just shows timers on those exterior lighting so that they're on when they should be on and off when they should be off. Um, so that takes care of pretty much this entire list. So if you go with this list, this is really gonna be able to help you navigate what should be submitted in there. Now, we do have to talk about something for the 2021. And the 2021, is uh, there is a requirement to have this additional efficiency package option and it will need to be declared as far as what you're utilizing. If you go res check on res check, there is a, you know, you go through and you can check which option you wanna utilize, whether it's the enhanced per, uh, you know, envelope performance or whatever the case may be, you're gonna check it. And, and that's what your, you know, the plan reviewer is going to look for to make sure that these things are, are being done. So the options that you have for this is your enhanced envelope performance. So it has to be 95% of your total UA. So that's going to be a res check. That's going to show your 5% better than code. You're going to have more efficient HVAC equipment. So that means you have to be at least 95% uh, for a gas furnace, 16 sear for air conditioner, or 10 uh, uh, HSPF, horse speed, power. Oh, I'm going to mess it up. Um, HSPF or 16 sear for your air source heat pump or 3.5 COP for your ground source heat pump. The other one is reduced energy use in a service water heating. And that's, you know, 82 EF uh, for fossil fuel services. If you're going with electric, it just would have to be the 2.0 um, EF. And then if it's a uh, solar fraction, it would need to be the 0.4. Uh, the other one is more efficient duct thermal distribution. And basically what it says is all your duct work is within that thermal envelope, the building thermal envelope, or your uh, hydronic system is complete within the, the thermal envelope, or your duct thermal distribution system is completely within that building thermal envelope. Or you can do improved air sealing and efficiency ventilation where you're, you're less than 3.0 um, uh, on your blower door testing, and then you install an ERV or an HRV in that, and then they would have to have a 75% sensibility recovery efficiency, uh, no recirculation for defrost, and your ERV has to be uh, less than the 50% latent recovery moisture transfer. So out of all of these, to be quite honest, I know it sounds, it might be cumbersome and what have you, but when you look at it, really the majority of like the duct work, for an example, I, I 
don't see a whole lot of duct work anymore that's outside that thermal envelope or you know your efficient HVAC equipment. I see an awful lot of HVAC equipment that would well meet this and, and be just perfectly fine. And so don't get discouraged by that. Chances are you're already designing your projects and have this information already in place. You just have to declare it so that it's very clear for you know the plans examiner, but the contractor knows too, oh, okay, so this is something I really need to pay attention to and the inspector. The other thing is, help me help you. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of tips, not required, but just some tips that could be very helpful for you. Place all of your energy items on its own sheet. Um, there is a builder I know that has a couple of pages and puts all of their energy information on these sheets. Of course, this shows, you know, the like air barrier details and but also shows what the insulation is and all that and has a list of, of information. This is something that's going to be very, very helpful for you. And I can guarantee you uh, any plans examiner who gets this type of a plan will be very happy. And it's so easy to get it through in this fashion. Doesn't mean that it's just a slam dunk and that there aren't going to be any issues. But where sometimes you have that you know, conversation back and forth. Well, it's on sheet six or it's on sheet, whatever the case may be. And it's just something that gets missed by a plans examiner because there's an awful lot of black and white on that page, right? And sometimes nobody's perfect and it can't find it. And so help them find exactly what it is you wanna do. They look at two pages for energy or a hundred pages for energy. So keep that in mind. The other thing is use rest check right? ResCheck has a component. If you go in there into the system and you're utilizing it, it gives you the opportunity that you can place exactly where this particular uh, uh, information is found, right? So you can put in there, oh, okay, so ceiling insulation. Ceiling insulation is going to be found on A3. I know when I get that res check and I can look at it, it has A3. Now, forever and a day, architects have not been taking the time to do that. So quite often, even when it comes into a plans examiner, they aren't necessarily looking at the inspection section to see if there are comments that tell them where to find this information. So you might put a little note on there that says, you know, components found in rest check will be placed in comments for sheet or something like that. So it directs the code official or the plans examiner oh, great, I have a document here that's gonna walk me through exactly where I need to be looking. And, and here's what it looks like in the program, right? Right below there, it says requirement will be met, yes. And it says plan or reference page section, great, A2. And then it translates um, to what you see on that top part there. The other one, use an index to say where this, information will be found. This happens to be from, of course, you know, a, a simulated performance where they're required to put in, provide an inspection checklist. They're not required to say what sheet location um, you're going to find this information on. This particular company does do that. And so that is a great way. Create an index. Cr tell them exactly where they need to go to find that information because it's not just helpful for the plans examiner. It's helpful for the contractors, it's helpful for the builders, and it's helpful for the inspectors. And then the components on how you design the building is really gonna be implemented down the road. The other thing is there are resources available out there. We have some, we have created through um, Excel Energy, uh, some submittal documents that, that really explains everything that you just saw here. You Here's the list of the components that are required, no matter what, you know, no matter what compliance path you use, these items are required. And then it's broken down into the various uh, compliance path. Here's what you need for prescriptive. Here's what you need for the, the performance path. Here's what you need for the ERI. There are resources out there available for you. And if you have code questions, there's this great helpline. It is coloradocodes.happyfox.com slash new. I'm going to put this information into the chat box here so you all have it available. And what it will do is you can go in there, you can create a ticket, you can ask a question, energy, building, whatever the case may be. We've had a ton of questions that come in in the various codes. 
and the uh, subject matter experts will get back to you. Typically it's within, we do it probably within a couple of days. Um, it, it's back to you where you have that, that answer for you. So you have resources there that's available for anybody within the state of Colorado or who is working in Colorado. Sometimes people think, you know, for architects or builders, you know, you're working in Colorado, whether you technically live in Colorado, um, this is available for you. The other resource that is out there is we have these wonderful Wednesday webinars that happen. And here are the upcoming uh, scheduled training that will happen. I know it looks, you know, a little short on the Colorado Energy Office side, but their fiscal year only goes through the end of June, they will have some more once the new, you know, uh, budget comes in. So there'll be some more that will be coming in later on in the year. But um, Excel Energy, which I spelled wrong there, I just noticed. Um, so please disregard the E. Um, Excel Energy does have some, some uh, classes that are up and coming. Here are the links. I also placed the links in the chat box. So you do have that available. And then of course, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to answer questions. Shoot me an email. I'll be happy to um, answer them for you. Um, again, the Colorado Codes Helpline is great for that also. And for all of you out there that are um, uh, AIA members and need the LUHSW credits, uh, send me your AIA number and I can get your attendance registered for that. And with that, that's the end of me talking. And I'm very happy to answer any questions anybody has. Yes, you do get uh, CEUs for ICC. They are preferred provider. So those will go out. I will uh, just preface this that um, Gil is the one who uh, does the certificates for me for both, you know, uh, dealing with AIA and uh, uh, ICC. He is teaching at Educode, so please bear with me. These will not go out to probably next week. So, but they will go out. And again, and I am I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, no, uh, insulated attic ductwork is still allowed. Um, it's just if you are going to put your ductwork, um, uh, Hannah, email your me your AIA number because I won't have it available to me after uh, the webinar stops. But uh, the uh, insulation for the, the ductwork, what it's saying is if you're going to place it outside of the thermal envelope, you won't be able to use that additional efficiency option, but you are still, if that ductwork is located in the attic, you are required to insulate it. Both the supply and the returns, depending on the size, are going to either be an R6 or an R8 type deal. Maybe it's not R6 now. I can't remember. Um, but at least an R8 um, if it's three inches or larger, which typically is what you're going to find. Yes, I will be happy to send out a handout to all those who were in attendance for this um, with, uh, with my slides so that they are available because truly we want to help you as uh, you know designers and contractors and builders to provide the information that's needed so that you can get through this process you know, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Craig. Uh, oh, I am. Uh, you mentioned you are working on a set of documents showing information uh, you prefer on plans. Is that going to be sent to us when you get it? Uh, what we do have is um, we do have a uh, document. It's a technical document that provides you with all the, the documentation that's required when you are submitting for 2021 or 2018. If you are interested in that, please reach out to me. I am happy to, to send that out. It's just another tool in your toolkit to really help you to get through the process.
Well, if nobody has any other questions, um, I will go ahead and shut this down, but you are always welcome to uh, send questions to me through email. And again, we do have the helpline available also. So really glad to see you all here. Really glad you were uh, participating. And I just hope we can continue working together to really get um, things going and get everybody what they need to move through this process as smoothly as possible. So thank you everyone. And I hope you have a fantastic day.